welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God. His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, June 24th, we're studying Acts chapter 22, verse 22 through chapter 23, verse 11. When the Tribune learns that Paul is a Roman citizen, he calls the chief priests and the council together in order to get to the bottom of the accusations against Paul. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, the Reverend Dr. Adam Kuntz. Pastor Kuntz serves as pastor and evangelist at Trinity Lutheran Church in Denver, Colorado. Pastor Kuntz, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me again. Let's talk context today, Pastor Kuntz. What should we know about the book of Acts and where we are in it as we prepare to look at the text we've got today? Uh, Acts' title is Acts of the Apostles. But remember that Luke begins the Acts with the statement of all that Jesus began to do and teach. So the story of the church and of the apostles sent by Jesus is also the story of Jesus in his body, the church, spreading the gospel throughout the world. That usually in the stories that we find in Acts works through specific messengers, specific apostles, But it is overall the story of the growth of the word of the Lord, Jesus Christ, throughout the world. Specific to today's text is the controversy that Paul has encountered in Jerusalem, the capital city of his own people, for whose salvation he would be willing in Romans 9 to be cut off from Christ. So remember the keenness and the intensity of Paul's emotion, especially about his own people, throughout chapter 22 and chapter 23, because it's very bitter for Paul to come to his own and, like his master, his own receive him not. Yeah, we talked about the emotion that you see in the, I mean, he basically gave a a sermon, an address in the previous text, the end of 21 into 22, where he's (laughs) recounting his own conversion with that desire for the people listening to him, you know, he's speaking in Hebrew to these Jews. He wants them to receive that same conversion. The The word, though, that it seems set them off, as we will pick up the text today, is that word Gentiles. That was the, mm-hmm. the last word we read in English. That's what they didn't like. What I mean, this is one of those things that I, I think we have a hard time grasping just how big a deal this was. Why, why is this word that Paul has just finished, you know, Jesus sends him to the Gentiles. Yeah. Why is this so hard for the Jews in Jerusalem to hear? Yeah, so I think sometimes when people think about difficulties people have with Christianity, maybe they think just about our doctrinal assertions, among which is Paul's assertion that the God of Israel is has located himself in Jesus of Nazareth. That is bad enough, as it were. In addition to that, People's objections to Christianity may have to do with the impact on their social or political or ethnic thinking. And when you think about the distinction between Jew and Gentile, understand it is a distinction that matters largely, if not entirely, both then and today to devout Jews. It is not a distinction, therefore, that when we read the New Testament, most of us, we find Uh, much interest in, to be honest with you. When people read, for example, Galatians, they're probably most interested in Paul's articulation of justification by faith. They understand that has some relationship to this Jew-Gentile problem, but they don't understand the animosity. Not so much, not so much from Gentiles to Jews, but from Jews to Gentiles. Uh, The way that Gentiles are regarded as disgusting So you don't eat with them. They're unclean. Or the way that Gentiles are seen as the problem, that if we could just get the Gentiles out of the land of Israel, all our problems would be solved. These kinds of ethnic self-regard. Now, obviously, we have that. Sometimes we call that racism, maybe, but 
it's sometimes it doesn't even have a name, right? You might be familiar with how different Latin American countries look at each other or different European countries look at each other or how Irish in this city in the United States may be thought about 50 years ago now, probably Italians or Poles where they share a religion, but not an ethnicity. So it's these sort of group self-regard that is really the issue. And especially the idea that the God of Israel is not only not only found in Jesus of Nazareth, but still worse, that that God of Israel found in Jesus of Nazareth is sending people for the salvation of the Gentiles, whom the Jews regard as unclean, disgusting, etc. You've seen that narrated in stories already in Acts. So that's the, that's the weight, even the explosive potential of that word Gentiles. Well, what's what's striking and ironic about the way this progresses then is that the Jewish crowd is mad at Paul, who is Jewish according right. to you know his bloodline, yeah. and and yet they're it seems pretty willing to work with the Gentiles, the Romans, in getting rid of this Paul. I mean, I suppose that yeah. that mirrors what happens in the case of Jesus, exactly. and, and they're doing it yet again with Paul. That's right. Yeah, and and you can see there that the dividing line here the the. Th- the, the one who is therefore a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense is Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. Because these ethnic uh, difficulties, which are also in the case of Jews and Romans specifically, political difficulties and dissensions and contentions, they can unite as Herod and Pilate became friends from that hour around the persecution of Jesus and of his people. Yeah, I think I think as we we reflect on this text, we're going to see more parallels to to what happens to Jesus and then what happens to Paul here. Uh, this is going to be good. So we're picking up the text in Acts twenty two verse twenty two. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, "Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live." And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air. The tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who is, Ro- who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, but I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. We'll pause there. That takes us through verse 29 of chapter 22. So again, Paul's speech ended in the previous text. They were listening until he said, Jesus sent him to the Gentiles. That's when the mob scene ensues yet again. What are some of the descriptions? What's going on as the mob begins to grow in its fervor? The mob, as it gets more and more excited, begins to desire the death of Paul. So there's always this interlude where they might listen to you for a time. And that is an interlude which in the ministry of Jesus extends over three Passovers, where people are fairly favorable to him. I mean, the idea that Jesus is rejected by all of his own is not is not viable, is not true. Similarly, Paul is received by some, and his own people do not altogether reject him. So the, the saying that you get in John's gospel about Jesus, which we applied a little bit earlier to Paul, he came unto his own and his own received him not, is not a statement about every single Jewish person. It is a statement about especially the leadership of their nation, of Jesus's nation, of Paul's nation. And that leadership, along with what is now becoming a mob, was an audience, but has become a mob, is a statement about their desire to now do him to death because of the wickedness of his preaching. And this is where you notice that preaching is really what gets people upset. Healings, sure, but it's preaching and teaching that gets people upset. 
the explanation, the identifications, the assertions that preachers and teachers have to make. That's what really gets people upset. So now that they've listened to him long enough, the audience is turning into a mob and they want to do to him what mobs can do, which is to uh, take people's lives in precipitous fashion. Now, Paul himself has connected his preaching and whom he preaches to the death of Stephen earlier on in Acts in chapter 7. So we're looking perhaps at this second for a reprise of Stephen's death. What's going to intervene here is that Paul has certain legal rights that Stephen presumably does not. And Paul will have recourse to those rights. But first, the mob wants to do something that they did to Jesus, not a Roman citizen, and to Stephen, not a Roman citizen. Yeah, I mean, it, the difference, it seems, between what happens in Acts chapter 7 and here in Acts chapter 22 is the presence of the Romans. The The Romans were right. largely absent there in Acts chapter 7. And, and the reason why was maybe a little bit, we weren't entirely sure. Perhaps there was a, a gap in Roman rule at the time is, is one of the conjectures I heard. But right. certainly there's no such gap here. Right. And, and the Roman authorities are pretty quick to step in when they see this mob forming. Right. Yeah, and when we use the term Roman... It's helpful to remember that in the Gospels, as well as in Acts, you are rarely meeting someone who is, we might say, ethnically Roman. People you're meeting, um, with the exception of a figure like Pontius Pilate, so when you see soldiers and so on and so forth, you're probably meeting somebody who is not ethnically Roman, uh, but who has become a citizen, or is at least in the Roman army, okay? So an analogy to this would be we have people uh, who are not born in the United States of America, but who serve in our armed forces and maybe then at that time or later acquire citizenship. Um, Similarly, not everyone who is a citizen inside or outside of the army is ethnically Roman. Uh, Paul is a citizen, but he is not obviously ethnically Roman, he's ethnically Jewish. So it's a little tricky to follow, although we have some modern day parallels. And it's helpful to remember those things because you can see that people will end up representing interests, which are maybe not theirs natively. And there is also some confusion about how you come to be a quote, a Roman Okay, which is not an ethnic identifier here in the way that Jewish is. And all of that adds to the confusion of the scene because they're representing, let's say, the government, the governmental power, the powers that be. And therefore, they have a duty to maintain order, which is separate perhaps from their ethnic interests. The mob composed here of Jews does not have any other interest other than their ethnic self-regard, which has been offended by the idea that the God whom they worship is interested in the salvation of the Gentiles. So what I think you see in a wonderful way, I guess I mean wonderful in a literary sense, are the enormous conflicts of personal and group interests that Luke portrays so masterfully. Hmm. Yeah, it, it really is quite the scene. And I mean, the I, you know, I love I love the way Luke writes about the you know, the, so the the soldiers realize what's about to happen. The Tribune says, "Bring him back to the barracks," and he says he's going to examine him by flogging. That's they get they get right down to it. That's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> quite an examination. Yeah, well, and and it seems strange to us, but all of this is, and it's this is something to be noted also with Jesus's trial before Pilate. There is a certain following of procedure. You might think it's brutal. You might think it's inhumane. You might think it is, you know, cruel and unusual punishment in the language of our Bill of Rights, but it is not strange to them. So something to note about the Romans, let's say in scare quotes, the people representing the Roman Empire in any case, whether they're Roman in any sense or not, in both the Gospels and Acts is that they do follow procedure. They are not a mob, and they do not behave in accord, in this case, with the wishes of the mob. That is the big difference between the destiny of Paul and Acts and the destiny of Jesus in the Gospels. Jesus is destined to die for for the salvation of the world. 
it is necessary that the Son of Man should, sh- should suffer and die and on the third day rise. It is not necessary that the servant of the Son of Man should suffer and die and on the third day rise, because the servant does not have the necessary death that the Son of Man, his master, has. The servant goes wherever the master takes him. Think about the advice or really the pronouncement that Jesus makes on Peter's life after his resurrection. When you are old, they will take you where you do not want to go, and another will dress you. The the mark of a servant of Jesus is that he is going where his master commands him to go, sharing in many things in which his master shares, but not necessarily dying. The perfect parallel here would be if after uh, verse 22, Paul then gets shunted off to the Romans for a second trial, a second condemnation, followed by a crucifixion. But that's it's not the time for that yet. So it's enough for the servant to be like his master in that he is taken where he does not want to go or taken where he would not choose to go, but He does not have to die as the master does. So there is always similarity between Jesus and his disciples, Jesus and his apostles. There does not have to be utter identity between Jesus and his disciples, Jesus and his apostles, because the Savior's life is a pattern for us, but not in every detail. That's right. Yeah. And 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 we haven't gotten there yet, but there's another, it is necessary for Paul Mm -hmm. that Jesus will give to him. It's, it's not necessary for Paul to die. It's going to be necessary for Paul to testify there in Rome. And so, yeah, we're going to, we're going to see a different, it is necessary for Paul than, than what Jesus has. I appreciate your, your comments about the, the, again, the Romans and scare quotes, the, the soldiers here Mm -hmm. following procedure, because I think that helps us to see then what Paul's approach is. He goes with the procedure and he, he brings up a matter of procedure. Take us into the way Paul handles being, I mean, he's about to be whipped. Yeah. How does he face that? Yeah. And I think that what I'm about to say, I hope is very helpful, especially to listeners in the United States of America, where we have an extensive set of constitutional and and other legal rights pertaining to us as American citizens. And I think sometimes Christians think, well, I should give up those rights because I'm a Christian. But this is, in fact, not the procedure of the apostle. The apostle has rights that his master, the Lord Jesus, does not have because the Lord Jesus was not a citizen of the Roman Empire. But when they are pertinent, the apostle makes use of his rights as a citizen. So the issue is that you should not flog a citizen. A citizen is treated differently than a non-citizen. Citizens cannot be, or at least ought not to be, are very rarely crucified. Non-citizens may be crucified with impunity. So they begin to flog the citizen. So Paul says, and I like the way that he says it, because it sounds obvious when he says it as a question, is it lawful for you to flog a Roman citizen? and uncondemned. So you have not you have not convicted me of anything. Even if you did convict me of a crime, you could not you could not crucify me. You might be able to flog me, but I'm uncondemned, so you shouldn't even flog me. And so that question comes up now and he creates his own legal process. This is a due use of legal process uh, based on his let's say affiliation, his citizenship. And the centurion hears this and is shocked that they have made this mistake. What has happened, I think, here is that they have presumed that a Jew is not a citizen, which is a reasonable, let's say, probability. Most Jews would not be citizens because in the first century AD, you are not a citizen by birth within the boundaries of the empire. After 212 AD, By decree of Caracalla, the emperor, you are a citizen by virtue of being born inside the borders of the empire. That is how American citizenship works today. Your parents might both be from China or Mexico or whatever, but if you are born in Omaha, you are an American citizen by birth. This was not always the case in the United States. It was not always the case in the Roman Empire. So they made a reasonable presumption that a man who is obviously Jewish and is involved in an internecine, intramural Jewish controversy is not a Roman. That's pretty reasonable. That's that's really pretty reasonable. In this case, they were wrong. 
<laughs> so they just begin to flog the guy because they figure, you know, we could sort of do whatever we want to this guy. And he, you know, I, I mean, I have trouble imagining this scene, but you're getting flogged and you turn around and you say, is this okay? You know, that's what Paul does. So, you know, this is the way it goes. And now they're like, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like they were treating you a certain way at the, you know, DMV office. And then they realized that your dad was in charge of the Department of Motor Vehicles. And now they're going to treat you differently. So that's that's what Paul has brought up. So they're going through with one kind of normal process. And now Paul has opened up, let's say, a different bureaucratic process. And this is going to get him out of the situation altogether. Now, this is not the first time Paul's done this. No. We saw this in back in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. And it, it's striking how he kind of waits till the end, it seems, to pull this card out. You know, he he did that there in Philippi as well yeah. when they're about to release him. He says, no, 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 no. We're Roman citizens. You need to come and do this yourself. Here, it's it's right before he gets flogged that he pulls the card out that he's a Roman citizen. It, you you mentioned the connection to you know to our time, and I think this is a very pertinent conversation. What does Paul's use of his Roman citizenship in these occasions? What does that have to say to the way we should live as yeah. American citizens with the rights that we've been given? Yeah, it's it's not wrong for a Christian to use the rights available to him uh, within his country of citizenship or residency or whatever the question may be. Now, the assertions made within our um, constitutional framework in the United States are not only about rights given by virtue of citizenship in the sense that a passport gives you entry into the United States in a different way than someone not holding an American passport. That is really what Paul is doing here. He's not making a claim about uh, in our American uh, traditional terms, nature and nature's God. Okay, uh, our, our constitutional framework, framework also makes claims about natural rights. One salient example is the right to life that are very strong claims. They are very similar to Paul's claims about God and the natural knowledge of God in Romans chapter 1. Paul's appeal here is not even that strong. So think about the rights uh, enumerated in, say, the U.S. Bill of Rights. Those are one set. But Paul's claim is a claim almost similar to whether you are in a consulate or the DMV or something, and you say you can't treat a citizen this way. Uh, and then you cite, I don't know, the U.S. code or something, something relatively obscure. But Paul is, is, is making a procedural claim about his citizenship. So not only is it okay for us to assert natural rights on the basis of how we have been made by the creator, that's a big part of our American political tradition, it is also okay for Christians to use those rights that are available to them by virtue of their being citizens of that county or taxpayers in that state or certainly as citizens of the United States of America. That is okay because Paul is making just the same sort of very procedural claim and he's going to use that to further the gospel. Well, I think that, you know this is one of those places where, to go back to what you were saying earlier about how the servant's life mirrors the life of the master, but isn't always exactly identical. This is one of those places where Paul does not actually do what Jesus did. Right. Jesus, as the lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Paul opens his mouth. Yeah. At, and so similarly, a Christian today were he to be falsely accused and, and brought before a court to you know, ask for a lawyer to represent him and to make use of right. those, as, as you said, what's in the law yeah. is not wrong. Even though Jesus didn't do that, That's yeah. we're not the same as Jesus. That's right. Yeah. And I think that that distinction between Jesus as the uniquely sacrificial atoning lamb of God and ourselves living a life in his pattern but not identical to him, when that is not understood, then we also will end up not recognizing the legitimacy of things, not only that our forefathers have done, right? I think about the Augsburg Confession talking about, um, you know, taking a, taking a wife in marriage, um, filing lawsuits uh, for recovery of damages, 
uh, engaging in just wars. Jesus did not do these things. But the reason for this is not only that our forefathers did these things and confessed these things, the apostles themselves make use of such civil rights, legal rights, political rights, because they know they are not the uniquely atoning sacrificial lamb of God. And when we recognize that distinction between ourselves and the Lord Jesus, then we understand how the apostles can make use of such rights that the Lord himself did not when some of them were available to him. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what Roman citizenship entailed, and particularly with the conversation that Paul has with the Tribune about how they acquired citizenship. <laughs> yeah, this is a big distinction, and it's a little bit of a, you know, it's a it's a little bit of a boast on Paul's part because Roman citizenship is given to let's say ethnic Romans, of whom there are probably not many in the New Testament church. Uh, by name, the closest you're going to get are maybe some of the Latin names written out in Romans 15 or 16. Julia in Romans 16, for example, after whom my daughter is named. The reason being, ethnic Romans are relatively few and far between. This would be like saying, uh, you know, let me look for who in the American population can belong to the Mayflower Society. You know, I mean, it's some of us, but it's not by any means, most of us. So uh, these kinds of things are uh, fairly rare outside of people who are ethnically Roman, who would belong to the traditional tribes of the city of Rome, um, who would bear Roman names uh, like Pontius Pilate or Julius Caesar, for example. Otherwise, you would get citizenship either by purchase, which is the case for the government official here in chapter 22, or you would be born to it. And the strangeness of Paul is that he is not ethnically Roman, but he is born as a citizen. This is purely speculation. The listener does not have to take this as gospel truth. But since we know that Paul has um, extended family in Palestine itself, right? It is his nephew who warns him about the plot to kill him um, in Acts. And, and we know that he is sent away to learn in Jerusalem. Uh, presumably to his own people, but that he comes from what is now the, the nation state of Turkey, uh, what is then the province of Cilicia. How could he be born a citizen? Well, uh, his dad probably teaches him to be a leather worker. It's very unlikely, therefore, that uh, the emperor is going to say, yes, this particular leather worker in Asia Minor, he's my favorite guy. He's a citizen now. Mm. Probably not. So the greater likelihood is that uh, Paul's grandfather could potentially have been one of the Jews who helped Pompey, the Roman Pompey, to conquer Palestine in 63 BC. This is by far the most historically likely thing that we know that Pompey, as a gift, gave citizenship to many of those who helped him settle the feud between uh, assorted Jewish dynasties or factions, and established Roman rule over Judea as well as other places in 63 BC. That would have been a gift to Paul's grandfather, thus making it explicable that Paul, uh, and perhaps his father, depending on the date of his birth, that Paul could be born a Roman citizen. Mm. Yeah, and it is that Roman citizenship, however Paul came through it to be born into it, that is what he appeals to. <laughs> Here, we're going to we're going to pick up more of that on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO, talking Acts 22 and 23 with Pastor Adam Coons. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. 
Welcome back to Sharp Iron. It is Friday, June 24th. We're studying Acts chapter 22, verse 22 through chapter 23, verse 11 with Pastor Adam Kuntz. He is pastor and evangelist at Trinity Lutheran Church in Denver, Colorado. Pastor Kuntz, prior to the break, we were talking about Paul's Roman citizenship and the way that he may have acquired it, perhaps through his grandfather. And Paul talks about other types of citizenship. He talks about heavenly citizenship. How do those two things work together, particularly as Paul boasts here about his Roman citizenship? Yeah, our, our citizenship is in heaven, he says to the Philippians. So the, the issue here is what is the point of having earthly citizenship since we have here no continuing home and our citizenship is in heaven? The point is that those things are not only gifts of God, but they are gifts of God which may be used in specifically in the ministry of Paul for the service of the gospel. Because what will ultimately happen here is that Paul is going to get himself uh, out of this particular situation and then into a different one, which will eventually get him into the situation of custody under Caesar and appeal to Caesar. So what's going to happen here is that the, this earthly gift of Roman citizenship, uh, in which Paul takes some delight. I mean, there is some humor, some irony in, uh, well, I bought this for a large sum of money. Okay, you know, so you just came into this. Well, I was born into these things. <laughs> so it's a, it's a little bit of a boast, you know, you just learned how to use all the different utensils on the dining table, but I was taught by my grandmother and my mother how to use all those utensils. I've known for a lot longer how to behave at a fancy dinner party than you have. I was born to these things. That's the boast. Um, Paul likes this kind of humor. Um, he likes to say one of their own said, all Cretans are liars. This saying is true. There's all kinds of in, inside and outside irony there, uh, including if the Cretan is a liar and he told the joke, was he lying when he told the joke? So Paul likes this kind of thing. But the point is that the earthly citizenship is going to serve the heavenly citizenship, that I don't have to flee from being a citizen in order to be a Christian. That the, the citizenship, which is now here merely earthly, the Roman Empire is gone. No one is a Roman citizen in this sense anymore. Was at this time, thousands of years ago, serving the heavenly citizenship, which is enduring. And I think that you have to recognize that Paul recognizes both kinds of citizenship, this dual citizenship, and that the earthly serves the heavenly, but the heavenly does not abolish the earthly. I mean, yeah, I think you, at least I get the sense that Paul's trying to catch their attention with these yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Even even going back to when he was first arrested and, and he spoke in Greek to the tribune and caught him off guard with that. It, I mean, like it's it's as if he's trying to make use of this earthly citizenship to the point of, of opening that door to talk about the heavenly citizenship. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know that any of these soldiers, the tribune or, or otherwise get that chance or are brought to faith. The fact that they're not named by name makes me, made me think that probably they didn't. But it seems that that Paul is, is trying to grab their attention in the hopes of that he gets the opportunity to talk to them about the gospel. That's right. And even if you say, oh, I'm not sure that Paul intends all of that, or I'm not sure that Paul knows that eventually he'll get on a boat to go to Rome, and so on and so forth, what you can recognize is God's providence in working it to be so. Right. Which is which is Luke's overarching point that God is in control of these things for the good of His body, the church. Mm, yeah, yeah, that that definitely comes through. So let's see how this text continues. Paul has played the Roman citizenship card; they've backed off. Now it's the next day. We're picking up in Acts twenty-two, verse thirty. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he, that's Paul, was being accused by the Jews, he, that's the tribune, unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set, them, set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck. Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, 
I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. That's where our text ends today. That takes us through Acts 23, verse 11. So, Pastor Kuntz, again, the Tribune has realized Paul's a Roman citizen. He's backed off, but he still wants to find out what's going on. And so he calls for the chief priests and all the council, and we hear about Pharisees and Sadducees here. These are some players in the narrative that it's been a while since we've met them, and they were Mm -hmm. very prominent in the Gospel of Luke, and Mm -hmm. early in the book of Acts they were around, but it's been a while. So remind us of of who the players are here at this point. Pharisees and Sadducees are, to some extent, a combination of what we think of as denominations as well as political parties. They share apparently the same religion, but have vast disagreements about the nature of scripture. Uh, That is how many books are in the Old Testament scriptures. And partly because of that, also, they have vast disagreement about uh, spiritual topics, resurrection, angels, the existence of spirits, also the idea that there is life from the dead. And that's what Luke spells out for you here. In addition to that, they are political parties with the Sadducees that's a that's taken from the proper name, the priestly name Zadok. They are generally a smaller group and are centered around the priestly elite, centered around uh, the temple in Jerusalem. And so they have their own relationship to both the Herodian dynasty as well as the Romans who rule overarchingly. The Pharisees, probably taken from the Hebrew word for the poor or the pious, are a group that arise, we know from the Jewish historian Josephus, they arise during the dissensions uh, in the times of the Maccabees, the second and the first centuries BC. They've been around for a long time. That's how Paul can be not only a Pharisee himself, but also a son of the Pharisees. That's like saying your great granddad voted Republican and so do you. That's the idea here. So there are political alignments as well as theological alignments. There's some, there are similar realities in modern America too. And so that's, that's what's going on here. Paul beca- is savvy about this because the Sanhedrin is simply the city council of Jerusalem. It seems purely religious to us because we usually don't have these sorts of things in the United States where the governmental entity is both ethnically specific and therefore also religiously specific. Um, Allegedly, uh, purportedly, uh, hopefully, our government entities are religiously and ethnically neutral. Mm -hmm. That is, you could be a white Muslim and show up in front of a majority black, majority Christian city council and get a fair hearing. That's the idea anyway, right? They're not doing that. This is the local self-governing ethnic and religious entity for the city of Jerusalem. And the Romans want to understand what their complaint is. That's how Paul gets put in front of them. So before we get to the way Paul takes advantage of the division that's there within the Sanhedrin, there's this interaction. Paul starts to make a defense. The high priest doesn't seem to want to let Paul talk at all. Take us into that first interaction between Paul and the high priest. The high priest is very upset that Paul asserts also not only with his prior, his, what he says in Galatians, his former way of life in Judaism, but that even to this day as a preacher of Jesus of Nazareth, resurrected from the dead, that he lives in good conscience before God. And that 
that good conscience is something that he actually possesses. Now, this is an assertion which sounds, I think, arrogant to Ananias as well as simply wrong, but it is an assertion that we also make in the Lutheran Church that through faith in Jesus, the Messiah, we live with a good conscience before God. And Paul's contention is actually that his whole life he has lived in this hope. Now, does he learn something in chapter 9, certainly about what God has done in Jesus Christ? Yes, but he has always hoped in these things, hoped in the resurrection of the dead, that the God of Israel would do these things. Ananias does not want to hear that because Paul is not identified by Ananias as part of one of the acceptable denominations slash political parties, Pharisees or Sadducees. Ananias identifies Paul simply as a blasphemer. That's why he wants his mouth simply to stop talking. And so he's going to command other people to do his dirty work and to slap Paul to silence him. This is some of the same treatment that Jesus receives. Um, But Paul doesn't apparently understand all the dynamics here because he's not really quite sure who is making this order or who Ananias is. So he gets in hot water for that reason. Mm. But he, he does seem to, I mean, he backs down a little bit when he points out who the high priest is. There's still a, a respect on Paul's part for what's going on. There is, and there, there is um, what is something very interesting is Paul's phrase, you whitewashed wall. This shows something that people may be underrate because Paul, when we encounter him, is usually making speeches and acts or writing letters. And so we usually don't encounter him unless we look closely, this is one example, the deep familiarity that Paul has with the words and the preaching of Jesus. Jesus calls the Pharisees whitewashed sepulchers, tombs, whitewashed tombs. And Paul uses the same phrase for the man who commands that he should be slapped. So I believe Paul is familiar not only with the bare facts of Jesus's ministry his death, his resurrection, he is also familiar with the preaching of Jesus very intimately, as we now have it written down in the Gospels. And he, uh, the irony here is that he calls Ananias something that Jesus calls the Pharisees, and Ananias is, if he is anything, politically or theologically, Ananias is a Sadducee. Hmm. And so I think Paul simply doesn't quite have the right identification for Ananias, because you're right, he does then respect not Ananias as such, or Ananias's theology or political convictions, but Ananias's office. You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. There is one more layer of irony here, where the Pharisees and Sanhedrin collectively are speaking evil of the king of their people, of the king of Israel, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate what you said about the way Paul echoes Jesus' words and how Paul apparently knew Jesus' words, mm-hmm. which is a, a good reminder. Sometimes we hear it still today of people trying to say, well, Jesus never said that, <laughs> thinking right. of the words in red, yeah. as if Paul, when he wrote his epistles or when he preached in Acts, didn't know anything about what Jesus said. No, in fact, they they speak the same. <laughs> That's right. I mean, the entire scripture is inspired, is breathed out by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is the very Spirit that Jesus Christ breathes on his disciples. So all the letters in the Bible really should be in red. Hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah, this is this is the word of God inspired through the pen of St. Luke, but this is the word of God that we are reading here in the book of Acts. Now, I, I find this scene pretty humorous when Paul does recognize the division that's in the room, Sadducees and Pharisees, and he, I don't know what the right image to use is, he, he throws the bone in that they're both going to go after and start mm-hmm. fighting each other. Take us into this scene. What's, what's Paul's goal? What's he trying to do here when he brings up the resurrection of the dead? There's there's a, a, a goal close by and a goal maybe farther away. The goal close by is that he may be able to get something productive rather than simply murderous out of this scene by dividing the assembly against itself. That is the goal close by. The goal farther away is to remember not only the emotion concerning the conversion of his own people to Christ that Paul, that Paul has – that we see especially keenly in Romans chapter 9, as well as 11, but also that Paul has actually been ordained 
to proclaim the name of Jesus, not only before the Gentiles or nations, equivalent words, hoi ethnoi in Greek, but he has also been appointed by God to set the name of Jesus before kings, as well as before his own people, Israel. And so this is a setting forth under terms that are acceptable but ambiguous before Israel. Because if you think about the phrase, this hope and the resurrection of the dead, the Pharisees do agree with Paul that there is such a thing. The Sadducees, of course, do not. And Paul is not really attempting to convert them here. But Paul means by that a hope and a resurrection, which is not only general or vague, but specific and found and available immediately in and through Jesus of Nazareth, who is risen from the dead. So this is very savvy on Paul's part, and I think apologetically very useful, that he starts out here, as he did also do with the Gentiles in chapter 17 in Athens, with points of agreement, that in setting forth the gospel, he begins with those things on which his hearers can agree. They may not agree on the entirety of the content, or they may not locate that specific agreement in Jesus. Paul will do that later on, but he is trying to reach them. So he says, I am on trial concerning things on which you and I agree. You, the Pharisees, knowing the Sadducees will not. So when he says it is with respect to the hope and mm-hmm. the resurrection of the dead, these are not just theological debates that he's talking about. Maybe that's what it sounds like, or and maybe that's how they hear it. Mm-hmm. But Paul really wants to talk about the hope that is in Jesus mm-hmm. and the resurrection of the dead that is in Jesus. That's that's really where he's driving at, as you said, in a long term sense. Right. Yeah. And and so when you when you see Paul pe- preaching in Acts, I mean, don't. You wouldn't do this to your pastor. You wouldn't do this if you were a pastor, I hope, as to be so uncharitable to judge everything he's doing by the first two minutes of the sermon. Um, He's going to say more. Um, (laughs) So you need to stick around. Paul's problem is that often uh, he gets dismissed within the first three minutes, the first two minutes. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So then then you get this great clamor that ar- arises. Luke Luke gives us the details about the Sadducees which make their their distinctions, you know, they don't believe in the resurrection or angels or spirits. Pharisees do. I, I find it really striking. It's the the Pharisees almost start to actually stick up for Paul suddenly. I, I mean, I really love that. They do. And I I love the I mean, Luke is so so unobtrusive, so gentle, so subtle in how he writes that you don't see the humor until, you know, he tells you they don't believe in the resurrection and they don't believe in angels and they don't believe in spirits. And the Pharisees get up and begin to say collectively, what if a spirit or an angel has talked to him? Well, of course, the Sadducees aren't going to agree with that because they don't even believe that those exist. So the dissension deepens as the irony deepens. That's going to be the opportunity for Paul to escape back into the loving clutches of the Romans. And this is one great difference between Paul and his master. The Romans are not the utter aliens to Jesus raised in the lower Galilee, an almost entirely Jewish area. Some Greek speakers, I think that's how Jesus is able to talk to Pilate. I do not believe they had to use a translator. But Jesus is a a mutual alien to Romans. Paul has grown up in the Jewish diaspora. He is utterly fluent in Greek. He does not find these people nearly so strange, and they do not find him nearly so strange. God will use that familiarity that Paul and the Romans have to some degree mutually uh, in order to further his purposes. And this is, I think, one of the most marvelous things about what we have in front of us today is the way in which God's works are displayed through what appear to be utterly chaotic situations. Because if this were on video camera, you would just see a bunch of grown men shouting at each other, squabbling, maybe coming to what we could call fisticuffs. And uh, Paul is in the midst of these things and maybe is unlikely to escape with his life, but he was also unlikely to be a Roman citizen, and he turned out to be one of those. Uh, 
So God can use these utterly to human eyes, chaotic situations also for his purposes. And that's, that's exactly what's about to happen here. Well, yeah. So Jesus then is going to reveal to Paul where he is headed, which is is quite striking. I mean, when we think about Paul coming to Jerusalem back in chapter 21 and then his arrest, it's like he's just kind of going in circles at this point. I mean, being surrounded by mobs, people want to kill him. He gets goes back to the barracks and he's in the loving care of the Romans, as you said at this point. But now in, in verse 11, we get a preview from the lips of our Lord telling Paul, to take courage and giving him this promise that he will in fact get to go to Rome. This is a this is an outstanding thing because it shows you the continuing presence of Jesus with his messengers. This is something that I think sometimes we either take for granted if we just rattle off the phrase word and sacraments, not understanding the weight of these realities that Jesus is actually with us. He is Emmanuel, God with us, even unto the end of the age as he promises. And it is easy to take things for granted when you are not suffering. Paul is in a place of potentially life-threatening circumstances. He is in an unknown place. He's in a Roman barracks. He's with people whose life he does not share, whom he does not know, far away from all friends and family, and at this very day, rejected by people with whom he has, remember, to some degree, shared most of his life. He was raised in Jerusalem, according to the teaching of the Pharisees, sat at the feet of Gamaliel, learned these things for himself. Paul was an up-and-comer. This is the organization to which Paul was supposed to report back when he was going to bring the Christians, both men and women, bound from Damascus to Jerusalem for trial. So Paul has wound up in a place far away from his own and despised by his own for the very reason that he once thought he was here on earth to serve God and his people by persecuting Jesus's Christians. So it's a very strange place that he's in. It is in that very place that Jesus comes, not hovering above him, but at his side, very beautifully. This is Jesus as a friend and a brother. He is Lord, he is master, he is king of Israel, but he is also, remember, a friend and a brother, very gentle, very humble. Now, that message is a message of both comfort and purpose simultaneously. Take courage. Do not be downcast. I am with you. As you have borne witness to me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness at Rome also. So this little verse is going to set up so much of the rest of Acts because there will be other contentions, other dissensions, other obstacles Paul's announcement on the boat, I don't want to ruin all the rest of your guests for the rest of the series, but the announcement- There's a boat? Spoiler alert. Yeah, there's a boat and it's a, it's a very Roman boat. It's got twins on the front for good luck. But the announcement that they're going to survive is seen as utterly ridiculous at the time. In just the way that when Jesus comes into the room and says that the little girl's going to live, that's the only time you see anyone in the gospels laugh. They laughed at him. So Paul is going to sound like an idiot to the people around him, but he has this word of the Lord Jesus. And so it's going to have to happen. You know, like you said earlier, it is necessary and it is necessary that he be a witness in Rome as he was a witness in Jerusalem. With just about a minute, Pastor Kuntz, help us to summarize this. What's the hope that's ours as Christians as we see what happens to Paul here in Acts 22 and 23? Jesus is at your side. Acts is not merely a book of events happening millennia ago. It is also the way that the Lord Jesus is with his church in this kind of power and encouragement and the giving of strength to the downcast and this friendliness and brotherliness that our Lord has with us. So this is something to remember, especially if you are a preacher of the gospel, but for any of the Lord's Christians, it is important to remember that he is at your side, gentle and lowly of heart, and you take his yoke upon you 
and you will learn from him and you will also with Paul find rest for your souls. The Reverend Dr. Adam Kuntz is pastor and evangelist at Trinity Lutheran Church in Denver, Colorado, helping us today with Acts 22, verse 22 through chapter 23, verse 11. Pastor Kuntz, thanks for being our guest today. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about the book of Acts, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week. Mm-hmm.